Well, I must tell you that there are some people saying I'm dead. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I felt I ought to come and say that I've been reincarnated in the same body. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to talk about the future because I think that we're far too much trapped in the past. Uh, we have a vocabulary for what we are interested in that's at least 200 years old. And um, our reality boxes are locked into the definitions of the vocabulary, you know. And, uh, but things are going to change. And I know they are. And that's what I'm ta going to talk about today, if I can uh, hold it together that long. You know, the future is a very nervous frontier. And that's why we like what happened in the past. And we model our models after what has happened in the past. Do you, do you all understand what a model is? You know, uh, that's the way they thought about it, so it must be correct. So that, that we bring that model in, into the into the present, and then because we brought it into the present, those that come after us carry it into their present. Uh, can you think of any reason why the old models should change? Why is that? Imperfect. Pardon? Oh, Dr. Tiller says they're imperfect. But that doesn't mean they can change. Oh, see? I always win when, when I talk to Dr. Tiller. <laughs> yeah, imperfect models taken as doctrine and carried and taught to us. And we're likely to do the same thing. But things are going to change because science is changing. And science is opening up a world or a model that hasn't existed since three or four or five thousand years. And actually, the model that science is opening up is probably not the same exactly, but it's a model similar to what you find in the Sanskrit language of at least three thousand years ago. And if you will bear with me, I'd like to talk about that and tell you about that. Is that all right? Yes. Okay. Another thing I'm going to point out is that there's a difference between making theories about something or the facts, the, the phenomena we're interested in, and actually experiencing them. I am an exterior, exterior angelist. <laughs> I mean, you can have an intellectual image of something, you can have an intellectual model or something, and, but unless you experience it, it's just purely intellectual. Would you agree? Yeah. And um, one of the things that went around parapsychology is that it never went into exterior, experientialism because they had to follow or they wanted to make parapsychology phenomena acceptable to science. So, you know, if somebody experiences something, you can't actually drag the experience into the laboratory, right? Because when you experience it, it happens like this. And I'm going to give you an example. One is on a vacation in the mountains. And one is walking up a path that is going up the mountainside, observing the great scenery. Right? Have ever, any of you ever done that? And one is walking around saying, wow, this is great, and this, this, and so forth, and so on, and suddenly the body stops. The body stops. One is continuing looking and doesn't realize that the body has stopped. And then it becomes aware the body has stopped, and the body takes three steps backwards, and the cliff falls away, 
right in front of this person, and, 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 and suddenly the knees get all so forth and so on, and then this one walks over and looks down there where the body would be mangled, right? That's an experience that doesn't involve consciousness. And uh, then one says, I better go back to the lodge. And when one goes back and drinks six martinis. <laughs> now you can't drag a thing like that into parapsychology laboratory, right? But this is what we're interested in, right? We're interested in this kind of thing. That can't even be called a premonition because it wasn't even conscious. What would you call it? Well, we know it's subconscious, but what would you call the experience? An anomaly, that's the best <laughs> word we can get up for it. We don't even have a word for it. The parapsychology of psychic literature does not have a word for that kind of thing. It has a word if you get an impression that something's going to happen. That's called a premonition. But that's after the fact, right? You have to wait to see if the premonition is going to come actualized or not. But, so we have a word for that. But we don't have a word for the most famous phenomenon in human history, what actually must be the most famous enduring phenomenon in actual history. Something in our system saves our lives. Do you understand what I mean now? Experiential? Well, you're not. <laughs> so what does parapsychology test when you drag something into the laboratory? Give me some examples. Are you deadheaded tonight or what? <laughs> Come on, give me some examples. What do parapsychologists test? Is there any parapsychologist here? Telepathy. Telepathy? Psychokinesis, precognition, intervention, intervention. Ah. interventions, getting quite near what I was talking about. Michael Persinger does what? Yes, sir, I have been in that helmet many times. <laughs> The definition of parapsychology, as found in Parapsychology Sources of Information, published in 1973, says thusly, parapsychology is a modern and more restrictive term for psychical research, the field which uses the scientific method to investigate phenomena for which there appear to be no normal, that is, sensory explanations. Basically, this refers to phenomena subsumed under the general term psi that refers to the building blocks of telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, psychokinesis. Did you know that's the working definition of parapsychology? Well, here it is. I printed it out large so I could read it. You know, I'm getting old. Do you know how old I am? How old do I look? <laughs> what? Oh. I've been around for 72 years this lifetime. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> What's wrong with this definition that I just read you? Pardon? No experiential in it, right? But there's something else that's odd about it. Well, that's one thing, yes. So when they, when they say not normal sensory, there's over 18 or 24 sensory. That's not even referred to. The 
Answer me, audience. Answer his question. Nobody can answer that? Pardon? With what I'm saying? And what yes. yes. But there's something really odd about it. And you'll never know what it is until I point it out. <laughs> <laughs> there's one thing in this definition that's so taken for granted that it's not even it doesn't even appear as a question. Right? I'll read it again. I'd like to know if you can spot it. Parapsychology is a modern, more restricted form of psychical research. The field used, the field which uses a scientific method to investigate phenomena <laughs> for which there appears to be no normal <laughs> sensory explanations. What is the scientific method? Repeatable, Repeatable what? You're not quite following me. We are questioning which scientific method. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Nobody, nobody ever thinks to say, what is this scientific method they're using? Right? Damn right. <laughs> what is this current wonderful scientific method based in? Hypothesis, test, uh, analysis, conclusion. It's based in materialism, which is defined the theory that physical matter is the only reality and that all being and processes and phenomena can be explained as the manifestations or results of matter. When did that come into being? I know, but I want to know if anybody else knows. 1845. The four guys who got it together and pushed it into chemistry and then into physics were under 24 years old. And they have ruled the materialistic age. Now, the reason I'm focusing on these things here is um, I'm going to tell you what's happened to the only reality. See, if it was, if it was just a theory, that physical matter exists and that processes and so forth and everything can be blah, 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 and everything, but it's the only reality. This definition is taken from my trustworthy Webster's Intercollegiate Dictionary of 1974. This was still the official definition of materialism. Only reality, I'm arguing, you see. So when people say the scientific method, they're referring by implication to the matter is the only reality so if there's something around that is not made by matter, is not matter or something like that, they cannot test it with the, with the scientific method because it's not made of matter. Got it? I very seldom prepare notes, but the things I'm going to say are so earth-shaking that I thought I should. And I'm going to uh, <clears throat> point out one thing that the material sciences cannot explain, account for, or even find the mental processes that go on in it is consciousness. If you can't explain consciousness, you can't explain anything we're interested in. You can explain mercantilism. You can explain atomic bombs. You can explain everything else. But there is no currently existing science of consciousness. Here's a book by this guy named Roger Penrose, who's a very famous physicist in England. It is entitled Shadows of the Mind. It is subtitled The Search for the Missing Science of Consciousness. 
parapsychology should, from the get-go, have been interested in the phenomena of consciousness and not in the scientific method. I'm old enough, I'm over the hill now, I don't have to be careful anymore about what I say amongst my peers, so I'm saying it. There's no science of consciousness. How can remote viewing, telepathy, blah, 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 all these things be explained if they're functions of consciousness and the consciousness of science is still missing in the year 2006. You see why my colleagues found me a little difficult to deal with at times? <laughs> it has turned out, according to this book, you see, if I say it on my own, nobody believes me, but if somebody of this standing says it, then they have to chew on it at least a little bit. It's turned out that consciousness of science is not explainable as processes or result of matter. This book moans and groans about that for at least a hundred pages. It cannot be captured by the quantifiable method. It is not quantifiable as all other aspects of matter. <sighs> It does ask, I must say, what new physics we need to understand consciousness and the mind as well. Now, what has happened to the only reality? I tried to bring along a few things. First of all, this is Scientific American. Um, I don't know what the date is, but here's the cover. Has science missed half the brain? The brain is a matter thing, you know. And scientists have now begun to realize that they've missed half of it. Well, there it is, Dr. Tiller. <laughs> You wrote it too? I've read it. Oh, you've read it. Good. Isn't that funny? I think it's hilarious. <laughs> They've been researching the brain for all this time and they missed half of it. <laughs> These are the glial cells that were fought for, fought for a long time to merely bring nutrition, nutrition to the synapses and the neurons and the vitamins that they needed to work on and things like that. But now it's been discovered that the glial cells carry at least a hundred thousand times worth of what we might think of as digitalized information as well as nutrition to the neurons. Did, did I get it right? Yeah. Specialty of Dr. Persinger, Persinger in Canada has been locked out of his laboratory because he's gone so far advanced of the materialistic sciences that something had to be done about him. Did you know that? A mini, a mini inquisition up there. Laurentian University, right. Are you going to give part of this lecture? <laughs> Can you read this? Parallel universes. Now, quantum physics says the entire universe might be a hologram. Are you a hologram? Do you know what a hologram is? Tell me. Somebody who shook their head say, tell what a hologram is. No, it's not. It's an interstice of crossing light beam. So, you know, the ancients said we're made of light, everything's made of light anyway. That's what they meant. It's, it's probably a hologram. But since we can pinch our holograms, it, it might not be too, too real. New dimensions, multiple dimensions have been theoretically discovered and proposed. See, you can meet yourself in another dimension. Scientific American thought the advent of the parallel universes thing 
what's so important is they, they published a special little issue on it. Isn't that wonderful? The venerable scientific American who was strictly, strictly materialistic for 120 years. Do you know what the quantum realms are? Well, with these, little, with these, these discoveries here, do you think that materialism is, matter is the only reality? No. Dark matter has been discovered. He's winking at me. He's my nemesis, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know what dark matter, dark matter is? They do not know that. And would you shut up? <laughs> I, I, I think I should ask him to shut up because they've also discovered dark energy. Do they know what dark matter is? Thank you, Dr. Tiller. Do they know what dark energy is? They've also discovered subtle, sexy, erotic, all kinds of energies. These are the words they use to, in, to identify them. The reason I brought this up is because astronomers and scientists began to discover that there was more stuff in the universe than matter alone could account for. So they've now worked it up. It's been shifting around the percentages of matter and all these other things and so forth and so on to where the matter as the only reality only now accounts for four to seven percent of the universe. Scientists are saying that, not me. If I said it, they'd have thrown me out of the International Remote Viewing Association even. But matter's gone. I mean, it is not, it, well, it's here, of course, but, and we're still, we're trapped in it. But it's, but, but it, as the only reality for the only science, <laughs> or the only science of, real, of matter has now begun to discover that matter is not the only reality. And do you think the media tell you that? I wish I could see you better. These lines are terrible. So here it is, physical matter accounts for only something like 4 to 7% of the universe. Now, there's something else really interesting about all this other stuff. Did you look, ever look up stuff in a dictionary? Did you know it's a perfectly good word? You know, it, it's meant to identify something that exists, but they don't know what it is, so they can call it, legitimately call it stuff, you know. Who did that? I can see you better. The thing about all this other stuff is that it all interpenetrates each other. Does anybody here know what the word interpenetrate means? To, pe to penetrate between, within, or throughout, to mutually penetrate, to spread, or diffuse through, to permeate. Your physical body is sitting here, and all this other stuff is interpenetrating it all of the time. Did you know that? You didn't know that? You should, you should subscribe to a few science magazines and, and, instead of watching CNN, and you might find out about it. <laughs> all right, so matter alone is not going to tell us what the universe is made of. Matter alone is not going to tell us what consciousness is made of. Matter alone is not going to tell us what telepathy consists of, or precognition, or even remote viewing, right? So, that part of what we're interested in studying is over with, officially. And I'm going to tell you, there's a really cute story that shows where it has begun to change everything. Interpenetrating, interpenetrating. There was 
in the medieval ages, a term that was used, quintessence, which was thought to interpenetrate everything and was, some people thought back then, the basic building blocks of reality in the universe. Is that right, Tiller? Yeah, they're using it. It's come back now. I have a book on it. <laughs> if you have a book on something, you think you know what you're talking about. There were also, in the Middle Ages and even earlier, back into Greek times, the word ether or aether, which was thought to be the same, interpenetrating everything, including matter. There was also in Sanskrit the word akasha, or akasa. Are you, some of you familiar with that? Except in Sanskrit, the akasa was loaded with intuitive information. Did you realize that? That uh, if you could get into the akasa, you could find out anything. It was sometimes it was called the perpetual record, the record of everything that had happened or will happen, and so forth and so on. And um, these terms are drifting back into our postmodern sciences. You see, the modern age was firmly locked into materialism, and now that materialism has been locked down or reduced to 4%, these other things are going to become interesting. And that's why the future, what we're interested in, is going to change, because there may be some explanations in these other parts of stuff. Why does all information that the human bio body process have to be explainable as physical source or processes? Are any of you asleep yet? Now Sanskrit has a great deal to say about interpenetrating stuff. And um, when, when Sanskrit was first translated into Western languages, you see the, the interpenetrating concept, which is definitely in there. I have spent two years figuring this out, that there was the material level, there was this level and this level, and they were all thought of as differently when they got translated in French and German and uh, into English and everything. So we have the matter level, and we have the spiritual level, and we have this level, and so forth and so on. And these are thought of as distinct and separate, right? Stuff. stuff. Yeah. But they are stuff, and they're interpenetrating. And so in Sanskrit, other realities, see, I've entitled it, Sanskrit Other Realities. Oh, the quintessence book is entitled The Mystery of the Missing Mass of the Universe the revised edition of the Fifth Essence, published in 1971 by Lawrence Kreutz, Chairman of Physics at Case Western Reserve University, if you're all interested in reading that. These things are called lokas, L-O-K-A-S, and most of them are based on the root word bur, B-H-U-R, meaning earth, matter, material existence, and experience of man's earth world. Though the Bur Loka refers to the material universe, and it's the lowest of the universes, <laughs> the level, what do you want to call it? Ab above that, I'm going to talk about it from the English point of view. Above the Bur Loka is the Buvar Loka. And when you enter the burloka, you become into matter. You are forming yourself into the material world. When you come into the buvar loka, the world of vitalistic manifestation of embodied life, existence, and becoming within emotions, passions, affectations, which desire is the pivot. This is called in many mystical, the desire realm. Is any of that familiar to you? Just becoming matter doesn't do anything. You have to become, have desires and passions too. If you didn't have those, what would your physical body be?
a blob or something like that. Okay. The just between the Bhuvar Loka and the Bur Loka, earth and the desire and the desire principle is the realm of the entangled mind. It's in Sanskrit. The entanglement between physicality and the passions. And that ends up with the entangled mind, you know. So if you can't get above those three loka, you're sort of trapped in what is called the wheel of rebirth <laughs> until you can get out of it. This is in Sanskrit, but I have a punchline that brings them all together. Above these three lokas is the Svar loka, the world of pure light, pure unentangled thought and feeling and becoming within a pure psychic state or plane. Is that sinking in? Matter is entangled with passions and desires or vice versa, so you have entangled things as long as you're focused in that. And the Svar loka is lift up out of that, and you're in the... I'll read it again. You should jump for joy, actually. The world of light, pure, unentangled thought and feeling. Have any of you ever gone or experienced that state, condition? Come on, raise your hand. How many haven't experienced it? Well, now, there, no, there are half people here not raising their hands at all. <laughs> How does one know within oneself if one is there? This is not the question, period. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my great mentors, but he has to be controlled once in a while. <laughs> okay. There are several lokas. The Hindu mystics argue about whether there's seven or seventeen. We don't need to go into that. But because I just picked out the ones that we might have a chance of recognizing. <laughs> uh, there's the, let's see. Okay, I read that one. And I read Swarloka. That's the int intuitional plane. Akasha. Quintessence in these different languages. There's the Mahar Loka. The world, it's, it's described very simply as the realm of vast, V-A-S-T. We would say in English, the realm of infinity or something like that. And that's about all it says about it. Because obviously, the writers of these things here um, said if you're trapped in the first three locus and tangled in and things, you probably will never see the vast. We would say vastness, but they use the noun rather than, than the other word. So, now we would think of these as different levels, right? Down here, down here, down here, down here. But the clincher is that the Sanskrit discusses these as all interpenetrating. So we are within matter and within all of the other realms, but we don't know where, where we are exactly. We know we're in matter. Does anybody here not think they're in matter? <laughs> I've met a couple, actually. Interpenetrating. The Sanskrit discusses what we call consciousness, but it discusses it in different, slightly different terms. All of these lokas are interpenetrating each other. They're with us now, just like other dimensions interpenetrating our dimensions here. And they are also interpenetrating our consciousness. And our consciousness is a big thing of interpenetrating of these different locus. 
which means that they are available to us. If we can figure out how to get out of the entanglements or something like that and tap into them. So when you have a spontaneous experience of another dimension, is that explainable by science? Did you experience it in spite of that? How many here have experienced another dimension? Oh, see. Is remote viewing indicate, indicative of another dimension that transcends physical matter, energy, space, and time? Good. Have I bored you? Oh. Oh. <laughs> this is Dr. What is your name? <laughs> this is Dr. Stanislav Ojak. He's a psychologist, right? Yeah. Yes, he is. He's 92, and he's famous in backdoor experimental circles by taking pictures with a lens cap on and getting images on them. Take a bow. Stand up, take a bow. <laughs> Can you all do that? Now, you see, the disappearance of the matter-only theory has got to have great repercussions in starting now, in the future, you know. I mean, they're scratching their head about all these different energies, dark energies, dark matters, subtle energies, which Dr. Tiller is going to talk to you about tomorrow morning. And so, things can't stay the same. You imagine what's going to have to be dumped that was hooked into the matter-only theory? Matter-only reality theory. Can you think of what's going to be done? Just what? Oh. I'll let you tell them that tomorrow morning. <laughs> Have I made my point about interpenetrating stuff that has most recently been discovered by modern scientists? but which seems to have been known in a very potent language. Have, have any of you ever studied Sanskrit a little bit? What kind of language is it? Do you find it? Is it gorgeous, complex? Yes, it's extremely complex. It's, Yes. You wonder how they ever learned it. A language from light? Oh. Ah. Yes. Thank you. It's based in experiential consciousness. Whereas English and all these other things are based in what you were taught not what you've experienced. Did you know there are two types of gurus? Well, yes or no? no. <laughs> Sit there like rock. <laughs> I lean very heavily on um, The Language of the Gods by Judith M. Tyberg. The second edition published in 1976 called The Language of the Gods, Sanskrit Keys to India's Wisdom. And also on Ali, Arthur and Anthony McDowell's A Practical Sanskrit, Sanskrit Dictionary published in 2001. And also on the Hindu guys that ran my local magazine and newspaper and cigar store in New York, who actually had learned Sanskrit. So when I couldn't figure out a Sanskrit thing, a word, I took it up to them and I said, is this the right translation in, in, in the book? You know, they could, you know it's, a, it's a language of consciousness. So when a Western person translates it as an aspect of matter, I have a right to find out. So these, these guys in the tobacco shop said, oh no, that doesn't mean that. So I was helped by these three sources, by the way. 
But Judith Heiberg's book is a wonderful book. Are, are any of you here familiar with it? T Y B E R G. In Tyberg's book, but not only there, Guru is translated into English as a teacher, right? Okay. Um, there, there are three different aspects to this. Number one, teachers transfer to their students only the information they are supposed to, while learners receive that information the best they can. This is in the dictionary. Got it? So, you've been taught what you've been taught, and you've learned it the best you can, and the teacher's done the best they can to transfer that information to you. And second, information that conflicts with what is taught and learned is discouraged and not taught. Have any of you ever experienced that? Three, innate potential capacities that might conflict with what is to be taught, learned, are likewise discouraged, not taught, and not developed into reality, actuality. Rather. Have any of you experienced that? Were you taught remote viewing in, in grade one? Why not? Were you taught telepathy in the third grade? Why not? Did you ever wonder why not? I'll, I'll be easy on you here tonight. <laughs> Where's my two, two gurus here? Okay. Tyberg, and I'm sure she's correct, defines a guru as one who has the capacity to pass on his realization to those who seek him for wisdom. There may be an outer guru or guide who removes ignorance by the radiant light of his divine wisdom or the inner guru self who is the guide working through the intuitive part of the man. Have you ever been worked with intuitively by any of your teachers? Yes, I have. They're good teachers, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, there's one guru that can pass on his realizations of what he's learned. And it falls into the category of a teacher. Are you with me on this? There's a second guru, the one, the inner guru, who is the guide working through the intuitive part of man. That's the fourth loka he's talking about, the intuitional loka, which we, which we call intuition. Don't, do we not? How many of you had intuition experiencing? I have to make sure of the audience, you know. Do you know where the word guru comes from in Sanskrit? It comes from the root meaning gri, G-R-I, meaning to invoke, to praise. So a guru is basically, supposed to be anyway, invoke something in his chelas or his students. What would be the most likely thing that the second guru would try to invoke in his student? Intuition. He, he uses his intuition to invoke the intuition category or capacities of his students. That's different from just left hemisphere teaching, isn't it? That falls sort of into a right hemisphere interaction between teacher and student. We don't know that, but they knew it way back when, these Sanskrit people. Now, have I bothered you enough so far? Yes? So, invoke means to awaken, right? 
to bring into existence, to turn on the switch, any of those things here. And it's done by the intuitive interpenetration part of, of whatever is interpenetrating it, which is universal, apparently, because it pervades all existence. Have it, and so you can, you can awaken intuition, and when you awaken intuition, you awaken the uh, powers of intuition. We think of all this differently, you see. We think all of these powers are separate things. But what if they're all functions or modulations of intuition? Precognition, telepathy, so forth and so on, are just modulations of what we have translated into English from the Sanskrit is intuition. Just turning the dial on the band or something like that. And when they, when the Sanskrit people got together, they thought they could, you have forewarnings, you have premonitions, you have this and that. These are spontaneous occurrences, right? If you work for them, you don't get them. I'm talking about the spontaneous experiential kind. Because if you don't plan to have them and they happen anyway, then they're more real as if you try to happen and you make, mess it up. So these things, let's divide intuition in compartments, but it's all rotating. They're all interpenetrating with each other and everything. And at a certain modulation, you get intuition, what we would call intuition. We also get, could get telepathy, we get, could get clairvoyance, we could get traveling clairvoyance, and now remote viewing as it's now known, things like that. And these were referred to as the Siddhis, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, in Sanskrit. And there's a great deal of argument among scholars about how many Siddhis there are. Some say seven, some say fifty, and you know, like philosophers like to try to outdo each other all the time. The term city is translated in English with very good authority for many, well, a few centuries anyway, as an attainment. And I personally believe that's a bad choice of words because it should be becoming, it should be translated a little bit more as Becoming, becoming in an awakening of some kind on the intuitive levels. Anyhow, um, they are called attainments in the literature, the act of attaining, the condition of being attained, something attained, and an accomplishment. I shall now pick a few of these cities and um, um, taken from the sutra, Sutras of Patanjali. Are you all familiar with that? Do you sleep with it under your pillow? Yes. Try, try. <laughs> They're all about the cities. It's all about the cities. Sid Keith. And he's got uh, X amount of sutras. I forgot how many sutras there are. Tells you how to get out of the... One of the sutras tells you how to elevate out of the... Rain, the, the interpenetrating entangled mind, for instance. Others tell you to do this and how to do this and so forth and so on. And uh, the sutras in, uh, in, in Sanskrit mean thread. There's a thread we can think of as a thread of consciousness. And there are these little beads on it. And each one is a sutra. It's all part of consciousness. Oh, there are 95 sutras in his book. There's one sutra, uh, Siddhi, that is called Trikala Jnani Siddhi. And the least complicated way of defining this Siddhi is given as attainment of knowledge, knowing of past, present, and future via divining deeply into an object permanent phenomenon or idea. Do you know how to do that? I'm not quite sure I do, but uh, I thought I'd ask you here anyway. There's the dharna the concentration, the binding of deep consciousness awareness to one place, object, or idea until all aspects are revealed. 
We have hints of that in remote viewing, by the way. Do we not? Um, there's the Dhyana City, a type of non-objective meditation or contemplation which releases you from <clears throat> the more undesirable lokas, such as matter, entanglements, and desires and passions. And then there's the Samadhi Siddhi. It's, you have to work to attain these, you see. The balanced state to hold together completely, being one with so as to attain unities of deep perception. <clears throat> Samyana, Samyama. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Yeah, Samyama. Which transcends the plane of consciousness directly focused on gross physical matter only. Do you think this is not going to be rediscovered maybe a hundred years from now? Because we have all of these interpenetrating universes confirmed by science. Okay, there are also the cities that reflect Sanskrit knowledge of telepathy, of precognition, of um, uh, and um, clairvoyance and traveling clairvoyance, which was a term that was replaced simply by clairvoyance, and, and the traveling part of it got lopped off, and it got to be conceptualized in the recent 30 years as out of body travel. You see why I had to bring notes? Sutra 3.37 identifies <coughs> activities which awaken the asamyama, spontaneous intuition that functions without conscious reasoning. So if you're walking along a cliff and your body stops without conscious reasoning, you take three steps back, what has gone on? in your motor cortex. It takes the motor cortex to stop the body walking. It takes the motor cortex to move any motion at all. So the motor cortex has taken over because it or something like it sensed danger that you're too stupid up here to realize and just move the body back without any conscious reasoning. This was known back in Sanskrit times and I proposed <coughs> that it might have been known back 300,000 years ago when life was, physical life was really tough and the human species began to develop these life-saving intuitions and so forth. As a matter of fact, I'm told the American Indian nations still have terms for those. So, I mean, they do go back, they, they predate uh, the Sanskrit. Parasita, the city Parasita, knowledge of, other mental, of others' mental image pictures. What does that mean in our English? What? Mind? Speak up. Mind reading, right. Parasita, the actual whole word is Patya Yasha Parasita Janaman. Mm. Is that right? You. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, the knowledge of others' mental image pictures is obtained via this city. We refer to that as mind, mind reading or telepathy, right? What is the most hated of the superpowers or the cities? Which one? Telepathy. Nobody wants their minds read. Do you want your mind read? Yeah. Here's a copy of the New York Times. For Tuesday, January 2006, January 10th. Can you read it? Mm -hmm. 
cells that can read minds. These cells were discovered in about 1996 by two Italian researchers examining the prefrontal cortex of the brain in macaque monkeys. And they began to notice that macaque monkeys could look at each other and then get mutually excited about something and so forth. And they found the firing cells in the premotor cortex of the brain. The odd thing was that the one monkey who had an intention that the second monkey didn't like was transmitted somehow from the first monkey to the second monkey, or vice versa. But the same cells were firing in both brains, exactly the same patterns. So the premotor cortex was duplicating um, what was going on, and for that reason, they didn't quite call them telepathy yet. They called them mirror neurons. This monkey's premotor cortex was mirroring what was going on here, and then they gave a definition for it. What was being exchanged was the intentions and motives of the first monkey to the second monkey. The, this, the uh, mind reading of intentions, I'm sorry, I, I say intentions and, um, intentions and motives, yes. There's a, a, re, a reading that, I get a little excited over this, because this is one of the biggest jokes in history. The reading of another's mind, motivations and intentions is the formal definition of telepathy. Telepathy is in because these things have been confirmed in humans too. And the definition is the capacity to read others' intentions and motives. And this is the fundamental definition of telepathy. Do you like that? Do you know why this is going to change everything? If, if these interpenetrating things, it's going to take a while for this to be worked out. But telepathy now has a physical basis that science had denied that it did have. And now that it's a physical basis, in the, in the materialistic science, it makes it a legitimate phenomenon. Who's going to study it? Science? This is a scientific method. Oh, yeah. I can name you seven intelligence organizations that are going to be dumping money into telepathy research. Shall we start with our own, the CIA, DIA, the Mossad, MI6, oh, well, MI5 too. Do you think they're going you see, the Mobile Union got started because they thought the Soviets had something like this, and, and Washington finally said, well, we'd better do something about it because if they get ahead of us, then we're going to have a problem. That was the basic funding issue for remote, when remote viewing got started in the 1970s during the Cold War. Now, do you think that a lot of people are going to say, well, let them do it. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about the future. I could say more. Like, can the motor cortex be trained? I have a nice little thing here. Do you know what the motor cortex is? It's right up here, by the way. The premotor cortex is just in front of it. Do you know what else this is up here? The prime chakra, yes. And which extends through the auras. I'm going to read you a definition of the motor cortex, which you probably haven't ever heard of. Motor phenomena are regarded as necessary in all mental processes. Whatever sense the stimulus is given, the impulse has to go through the motor image centers. Did you know that? I did not know that for a long time, but eventually I found out. But without the motor cortex, what would your body be doing? 
What? Dying, probably. Be a blob, anyway. Now, can, can the motor cortex be trained? Have, ever, have, ever, have any of you ever learned to ride a bicycle? Did you teach the motor cortex how to do it? And when the motor cortex learned to do it, what happened? It became automatic. Did you ever learn to drive a car? Yes, the motor cortex can be trained. If the motor cortex can be trained on anything, oh, how did you learn to speak a language? That's the motor cortex doing this. The reason I had a little difficulty with Italian uh, versus French and German and English, French and German and English all use the same mouth and tongue movements. Did you know that? But Italian is different. It, you have to build in a whole separate motor cortex response program for that. Because, you know, easy, uh, we say easy in French, and it's facile in Spanish, and it's facile in, in French, and everything like that. But in Italian, it's facile. <laughs> And I said, why am I having such a tough time? I was trying to learn this in the Romance language motor cortex units over there. But you have to build a whole new one, right? So if you build a motor cortex program which matches what you want to do, it will can become trained and it will become automatic. That is now beginning to be understood. That's what happens in good remote viewing training, by the way. You, you activate, you build a program into the motor cortex, which takes care of the information signals and so forth, and you don't have that to start with, but you can create that and build it. Now, do you have some idea why, as this is my fifth swan song, and it may be my last, I wanted to tell you a little bit why the future is going to change with respect to all of these things that we've been mutually interested in. I rest my case. Are there questions? Last time I spoke, you drove me off the speaking platform before I was done. Do I have time for two, three questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the testing. Yeah. Well, I think you'd have to get that book. What is your question? Um, what exactly is the difference? Oh. Yeah. Well, the difference is that the testing is done on the brain. Oh, they don't know. They can talk about it. <laughs> they can assign a name to it. And then they say quintessence. And that's the name for it, but they don't know about what it really is. Do you know what love really is? It's an experiential feeling, and it's called, you assign a word to it, and then you think you can talk about it, and you know what the word means, and so you think you know what it is. But basically, it's an experiential experience. And if you've never had that experience, you won't understand the word. Right? Okay. The book. I, I bow to the book, by the way, because it's rather out of my expertise, and I think you should go to a direct source. You know, yes, sir. You say this is going to change the future. How do you expect the future to change if we have this doll here, some child left behind that you need to get out by the end of life? Well, at my age, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Yes, ma'am. Translation question. I was wondering about the word entanglement and, and uh, the Sanskrit language. Does it in fact translate precisely to Yes, in, in this case, yes. And it is used, uh, uh, there, you, you know, Sanskrit has five or six different words for the same thing, as this lady mentioned. And but, so, you know, in, when you translate one, one of those words into English, you take the, the nearest English equivalent, and, and that's what you pop onto it. But most English words don't have five or six different variations of them, but Sanskrit does have that. But entanglement, which is actually a very old word, you know, the early theosophists were using it, and uh, the, uh, a number of uh, the, uh, the chemical, alchemical researchers of bygone years, uh, metals get entangled. You know, yes, it's a perfectly good word. It's just very seldom used. And the other word that's very seldom used in, when things are translated English is interpenetration. Uh, 
but you can go to the Sanskrit sources to sort this out, and I advise you to do that if you're interested. Yes, sir. I, I admire you for your courage, but you know, I thought about the future. Should people pick up on your work where you left off, or should they pursue their own style, like pursue their own? Well, they do that anyway, anywhere, in any field. Everybody wants to do one-upsmanship. And uh, so I don't blame them. I, I think that's fair, you know. I, I did my lot because I got paid for it. Well, a little bit anyway. And it, 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 I wouldn't have done it actually except a very highly placed person appealed to me saying, it's your national duty to do this. <laughs> and I said, oh. I said, how much do I get paid? <laughs> That went on for about seven years, by the way. <laughs> Any questions from over here? Yes, sir. Do you ever feel like you've affected a remote viewing target by viewing it, or is it just more like that? Well, um, we only have one confirmed event on that, and that's famous magnetometer experiment. But when you're trying to, you see, the CIA wanted psychic spies. And uh, we figured out we could get the person there by coordinates, which really did work, you know. And but we didn't know if we ever affected anything there. But um, the the magnetometer result came about. Did, are you probably you're not a lot of you're not familiar with it, you know? I was dragged off one day to the Bering Physics Hall at Stanford University, down into the basement, and there was. A, a magnetometer there, and I, the machine and everything, and they said, can you affect that? And I said, well, where is it? I can't see it. He said, it's buried in five feet of cement underneath your feet. It's surrounded by all of this and everything, and a super cooled shield and so forth and so on. And I said, oh, wow. How am I supposed to view something unless I can see it? This little recorder was doing this. You know, nothing was affecting this machine down there at all. And it was just doing this and doing this. And I said, well, I can't see it. So I said, let me try and draw it out on a piece of paper. So I drew it out on the, did a little sketch of it. And as I was doing the sketch, I could see the sketch, which means my motor system could see it, I suppose. And this little wavy line said it went. This doctor, I forget his name, he was such a nice guy, and he had five or six doctoral students witnessing this. There was a famous physicist from China. There was Hal up and myself, and maybe someplace else. The doctoral students took one look at this and turned and left the very basement of the very Hall of Physics without a comment. One of them bumped into the one of the big supports of the roof there and practically knocked himself out. <coughs> And, and then, um, once his name said, was looking there, and, and, and then put off, you know, put off is always going home. He said, can you do it again? <laughs> so now I knew what it looked like. I'd never seen a, a Josephson Junction before in my life. And that was what they had down there. And so I just looked at it and I scanned this down here, which put me into quantum reality contact with that down there. Is that right? Good way of saying it. So when you can see something here, you're in quantum reality contact through all of these interpenetrating things and you can get the information of it. And it did another little weak jiggle. And then the, the physicist said, and then put off, turned to the Chinese physicist, said, would you sign you witness this right here? And so that broke the quantum reality type of thing. But <clears throat> that was one shorter way of saying that quantum actually, I've never quite understood what they mean by quantum, you know, it's just a physical unit, word they've signed to some sort of unit and everything. But it's part of the physical and other interpenetrating universes. So <clears throat> if you can see something, it, it will, I suppose if you have enough power like I do, affect this thing over here. Anyhow, do you know how many Washington guys came out to visit SRI after that event? I think they made a ferry, plane ferry for it. Any more questions? 
Yes, ma'am. Have you looked into the future from the standpoint of I have tried to do that. I think they just got tired of ca uh, making a calendar so far ahead of time, but <laughs> they stopped. <laughs> I mean, that was what, 900 AD or something like that? And they were doing this calendar up here and said, what the hell is it? We're up to 2000 and <laughs> that, that's 45 generations ahead, you know, is this a waste of time or not? I do, nothing that I've seen has picked out that year precisely. But uh, aside from that, it could be the date that the Greenland ice pack slips into the Atlantic Ocean, <clears throat> which is going to maybe stop the calendar or something like that. But uh, <clears throat> in intellectually, I can see the romance of that, you know. But in my in my perception, I I I don't have those any any, any particular impression about that particular day. Yes, ma'am. Um, from the restaurant, do you perceive that you're doing this? Do you think that there's always one in the body, or also one in the body? Well, <clears throat> the literature that I was referring to was referring to the one in the body. But there is a loka that uh, I didn't mention to you that is part of this interpenetrating thing where what they call these deities that can talk to you if you get your mind up there or something. It's all interpenetrating. You know? And this is all in consciousness too. Just because we have these areas blocked off or retarded or something or not turned on doesn't mean they don't exist in each of us. So, yes. All right, I'm getting tired. <coughs> Any more questions? Are you getting tired? <laughs> Another question here. Um, I've been reading recently about um, the Christmas Christmas and then it seems to be No, I haven't looked at it, but there is a lot of confusion about where in and if he existed. Uh, I was interested in those when I was 25, those kind of books when I read, I read all those, but uh, he, he's now out of favor, by the way, because they, they can't pin him down. You know, there, there's several entities like that. Have you had enough? I thank you for... Yes, ma'am. No, a very famous crop circle person visited me about 10 years ago and we went to dinner and I, and I didn't say anything, he didn't say anything about crop circles and finally at dinner he said, Ingo, what do you think of crop circles?